All right, thanks. Um, so last talk tonight, we're going to talk about uh, design after all these great talks about cameras. Uh, what I'll be talking about is the model view view model uh, architecture and how we used it in one of our apps. So if you have been working with legacy code bases, things that are coming from C++ or maybe C, uh, this might be useful to you. That's exactly the background that we had in getting a observer pattern going all the way from C++ up to Swift. Uh, also, if you've been uh, excited about the KVO upgrades in Swift 4, I can show a really quick example of how that works. Uh, and maybe you've been working in uh, MVC, or you've tried Viper, or other things, and maybe you are using MVVM, maybe you're not. Uh, this is just one another alternative to how you could structure the code in your app. So uh, I've been a game developer by trade. I joined Propellerhead here in Stockholm in 2013. Music has been my life for the most part. Uh, and I also like doing some photography stuff as well. So what we have is a mobile app, which is built on a uh, old C++ code base, which I say old because it's been around for 20 years, uh, but it's still in use and still new versions of this app are being shipped on desktop for both Mac and Windows. And this is a real-time application. Uh, what that means is we have two threads and one of the threads uh, drives the other. In our case, it's the audio thread. It can't block, you can't allocate memory, it has to run really, really fast. You do all your heavy metal uh, processing there, no pun intended, and then you do the UI stuff that you sync up on the main thread. And we've built this using Swift 4. Uh, we were lucky to be able to start the uh, uh, project right around the time that Swift 4 came out. And we use Objective uh, C++, which is a, a redheaded stepchild, somewhere sitting between Objective C and C++ to get those two to work together. And of course, the bulk of the code in our app is built on C++, which is real-time uh, audio processing. So first, about MVVM. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, the goal is to get the business logic out of the presentation. When you start writing uh, applications, you put a little bit of stuff in the view controller, and you put a little bit more stuff, and then you put something in the app delegate. And you're like, oh, no, just a couple more lines. This kind of handler, I'll, I'll throw it in here. The delegate, apples, samples look like that. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, next thing you know, you have root view controller, and it's like 3,000 lines long. Um, and you're trying to find some way to cut that stuff out. And you're in extra trouble if you're trying to port your app to some other platform, uh, like Android, for example. So what uh, the view model is supposed to do is the view model is supposed to take all the responsibility away from the view. So the view becomes really, really stupid and just worries about showing stuff on the screen. Uh, if you take the view model in the this layer of this, this design and make it platform agnostic like we did, then you can have a multi-platform view model code, which does your layout. You can have concepts like tables and collections and things like that that are going around in a cross-platform layer, which then easily could be hooked onto something else like whatever the other platform you're going to port to has uh, their constructs. So you ask yourself, well, what goes in a view model? What goes in a view? And this is the part where it gets really confusing until you do it about five or six times, it's, it's hard to get it all straight in your head. What you want to do is you want to have just view stuff in the view layer and no knowledge whatsoever about what happens in the model land. So any domain specific unit types you would have like uh, uh, samples or how many measures are in a bar for music or whatever the actual thing that you're processing, the records of your database, none of that should be anywhere in the include chain of your view. What the view model does is the view model has a set of handlers uh, for your UI events, which obviously you could be binding uh, to the view using a binding technology. There's several alternatives there. Uh, you also have inspectors so that the properties that show up in the view can be exposed. So when the model triggers a change for something that changes in your data model, those properties are automatically called through the callback, and then your view gets updated, and it always has the right state. You don't have to use a getter anywhere to explicitly retrieve it. The view model also handles uh, state. This is the part where the multi-platform part comes into play. If you have something like, what did I have set up in my view, or how many child views did I have, or how much data am I currently showing, when, how many pushes and pops have I done, things like that. You could put that into the view model, so the state of your application uh, from the view perspective could be saved here. And that also helps remove that management of uh, what's happening in the application away from the view and into the view model. And of course, coordinate system translation happens here too. In our example, we're taking columns and rows in an ab abstract table view and turning them into uh, measure beat tick, musical notation, uh, and pitches inside of a piano on the model side. And then the model is the easiest to understand. The model has all your domain-specific stuff. That's the guts of your application. The current state as it's running, where you're serializing things, 
and the persistence between different levels. In our case, we don't have pure MVVM. Is it a, to do pure MVVM, you have to have a binder, and the binder then makes it really easy, so you don't have to have any callbacks or things like that done by the programmer, whether you have XAML or you have uh, RX Swift or things like that. They'll handle both sides of the, the layer for you to get data back and forth between uh, the view and the model. But we use uh, view model handlers to take arbitrary uh, abstract UI events and turn them into model mutators under the hood. So, okay, that sounds fairly simple. Of course, that, that's not so tough, but visualizing it is, is, is tough. Um, some pointers to keep about this. Like I said, you should never have units and types about the model in the view. You should never be able to mutate the model from the view. And you should only be able to set the... the it should be a one-way road, ideally. Your view should not be able then to, to modify things through a property. In our case, we pr helped protect this by using read-only properties, uh, which I'll show you in a few minutes, uh, through the Objective-C++ uh, view binder. So that we're guaranteed there won't be any abuse of that power going on there. The view model has the handlers. The view model triggers the property callbacks when the model actually processes that uh, correctly and has not thrown an exception or had some problems uh, handling the, the callback. And the view model knows only as much about the model to accomplish the mutation. This is the part where it gets kind of sticky in a gray zone and it can snowball into the view model knowing about everything in your application. But you need to be very careful to have just the parts that you need to translate to uh, the mutating functions or the mutators themselves on the model classes. And of course, the model should never know about things like columns and rows, things that are exclusive to your, your view area. So how did we slice this? Um, this font doesn't show up so on the screen. These slides will be available uh, online later, so don't worry about uh, reading them. Basically, what it means is we have these three layers between the, the view, the view model, and the model code. Uh, for us, our view is all in Swift. Our view model is an objective C++, and our model is in C++. And the way that we get through this is we have property KVO, delivering the value of the model into the view here. We can do that through Swift 4. We have UI event handlers coming in here, like handle tap on the screen, handle slide on the screen, handle pan on something. And then here, the view model has setters. So it says model set value to X. And then we have an observer pattern here in C++, which does more or less the same thing as KVO, where the view model listens to state changes in the model layer, if those handlers are processed successfully. Um, this is a UML diagram. Again, this is uh, not readable right now, but you can look at this later if you want. It basically just shows how we've broken this up with classes and the kind of names of functions you would expect in different layers. Things in the view are scroll here, tap this, do that. The view model receives those UI events, and then the model actually makes changes and gives you back the uh, correct uh, values for representing them in the uh, inspectors. So, how does MVVM hold up against others? Well, it does help prevent massive view controllers. Our view controller code is very lightweight. Uh, most of the view controllers that we have are just about handling some Apple-specific delegates for like how something like a collection view, which is an Apple-only construct, uh, behaves. It also helps you keep an abstraction for a headless app. So we do all of our tests. When we add new functionality, we start at the model layer. We add a test unit test for that. And then we have some unit tests at the view model layer, which is also C++, and verifies that we can do things like handle events and then change values, and they come back uh, to the values we expected. But all that happens is C++. So that code is tested for whatever platform it's going to be on, and that logic exists for wherever we want to port to someplace else. Uh, data binding does exist on Android, and there's lots of alternatives which have uh, been shown in other talks for iOS as well. In our case, we use Swift for uh, KVO. The downside is you have to think about where to keep your code. Uh, it's very easy to get lost and think, oh yeah, well, I, I, can, I can talk about this kind of state in the view level when actually you're kind of sliding into the realm of, of what uh, a model data type would be. Even though maybe they're both floats or ints, but in, uh, from a conceptual standpoint, the same type and that, that uh, type def that you're using in C++ should not be able to be referred to in your view code. Um, there's no native binding, so it makes a little bit of extra coding. And there's lots of functions and boilerplate to go between, especially if we have C++. Uh, in our case, we have to have this view model bridge that allows us to get from Swift through Objective-C into C++ 
and back the other way. So there's um, dumb wrappers around all of our properties, uh, which also exist in the C++ view model as well. And of course, the view model then becomes the closest thing maybe you have to a god layer in the application, because it has immense knowledge about what happens in both the model and the view. So that's MVVM. And one of the options you can use in MVM for your observation is Swift 4, KVO. Um, if you are new to KVO, it's Apple's implementation of the observer pattern. There's also a notification system that you could use uh, in Cocoa and its notification. But KVO gives you access to properties in a fairly lightweight, lightweight way most of the time. Uh, you basically register when you care about something, and then you'll get notifications when the state changes. In Swift 4, this is a lot less cumbersome than it used to be, because now you have a block format, so you can write it all inline and just have your block triggered whenever that property is modified. And you can also use your key path types in a type safe manner now. You don't have to use uh, string literals or quote marks, and they could possibly fail at runtime in your code. Uh, the runtime checking will happen. The, the, the checking will happen when you compile. Uh, it will make sure the property you're referencing actually does exist. You use a backslash to reference that. With Swift 4 also, the um, inference of Objective C is gone now in the interest of speed. So you need to be explicit about this if you're going to use some of these members or functions that you want to have carry over Objective C. And you also need to use the dynamic keyword if you're creating a property on a Swift class that you want to uh, function with this system. So the way that this works is you start out with uh, an observation. And the observation, you assign it, probably in your view will appear. And you'd say, hey, view model, I want to look at this particular element. In this case, we're looking at the node events member in the view model class. So we use the backslash and then a dot and then reference the node events. And then we have this series of options we can use that will tell us when that block is triggered and how it's triggered. In this case, I'm using the uh, new, old, and initial uh, attributes. So the initial option will get your block triggered right away. This is great, so you don't have to double up writing the same code twice. So when you use initial, then as soon as this code executes and the view will appear, it will immediately call this callback as if the property was modified. And this is how you can initialize uh, your view value to whatever is stored in the model. And then you can also ask for dot new and dot old, which will give you the value before the change happened and the value after the change happened, if you've implemented uh, your class if it's a custom class uh, with KV uh, compliance. So if I had an array of 10 members, and then after an addition, I had 11 members, I could get both of those back. And I would also get, uh, if I did it uh, all the way down, a series of indices telling me that which index of which element was inserted. So I could just operate entirely uh, on the diff. So uh, how is this compared to KVO in the past? It's easier to write. Um, you don't have to worry about third part. Uh, third-party dependency, no Carthage, no CocoaPods, things like that. And you can optimize this to limit redundancy. For In our case, we have C++ in the back end, so we use uh, proxy objects. So there is not actually an NS array living somewhere in our code that we translate. We talk about a C++ standard vector, which lives somewhere else, and we wrap around that uh, using a proxy object and some callback hooks that uh, simulate the effect of having a contiguous uh, NS array. The downside is that this takes a little bit of time to get used to. Um, it's, it's, it's a little strange, a little unique. And the compiler error messages are not very helpful. Um, it took me a while of hacking on it to figure out what, app, what the code meant when, when it was not working. Uh, and there's not many examples. So I have a really simple example up on GitHub, which you can look at later, uh, which also illustrates how a proxy can operate. Um, the proxies are difficult to get right. Um, as Daniel knows, because we've been working on this in the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we have a large array of structs, which are coming from C++ over to Swift. And we're trying to figure out the best way to get only incremental changes on those when we're working on a large set of data. So some things to remember when you're working with KVO. Uh, you need to deregister from your observations when a view disappears. It might, you might wander into it poorly where you pushed or showed up a modal view and then came back and view will appear, got called again. Now you have two notifications floating around. You're going to get the messages twice and things like that. So it's really important to clean up after yourself and deregister when your view leaves scope. Uh, if you're using handlers, make sure that you make your properties read only. That way you can help prevent abuse from somebody going in there and trying to actually modify it. 
and make sure you keep the paradigm of a hand, uh, abstract handler function going through and, and taking care of uh, all your requests for mutation. There are two functions you absolutely have to call when you use KVO. You have to call uh, will change value at key and did change value with key. You always have to call both or it's not going to work. Uh, if you don't care about the granularity, you can call both at the same time. But if someone is going to want to know what the old and new value is, you need to make sure you break up your code on the back end side where the model is that says, OK, now I'm going to change this value. And then the KVO will then ask for the new value. Now it's become this. And then you will get that, def, that diff of those two values cleanly uh, in your KVO block in Swift. If you want to work with container types and proxies, there's a lot of functions you need to override. And this takes some, some work. Um, here's an example of the five most important that you might care about. I have some links in this documentation or a presentation for references where you can get more details on this. Um, also with proxies, as I said, there's a couple ways you can redirect the accessor. Um, you can override mutable value for key. In this case, I had a value called array value, which is my property. Uh, you could have that just go back to value for key, or you could use mes message redirection at the Objective-C class as it is uh, in particular and use forward invocation and method signature for selector to make sure that you just route the call to that property to the function that has the proxy object inside. Whatever it is, um, if you're going to have a proxy object on the back end, which is very heavy to create, if it's, for example, an array of structs or something like that, uh, it's not good to make a new array full of that stuff every single time you want to inspect the change of that value. So this is that case where you'd want to get this right and make it work so you can only retrieve a range or a slice of the entire set. Here are some references uh, to KVO that I found useful going through my stuff. At the bottom, I have my uh, Swift binding test, which shows how to use Swift for KVO and go from Swift uh, to a C++ view model in a very simple example. And that's it. Thank you. I went through that really fast. Do we have any time for questions, or should I just hang around? Two questions. Yeah, so um, I'm assuming that when you get the callback, uh, it's on the same thread that actually made the change on the object you're observing, or? Yes. Right, cool. It happens on the main threads. You don't have to worry about race conditions or things like that. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask why, if you have so much logic inside of your model and view model, mm -hmm. uh, why actually do you need to implement MVVM and care about view at all? I mean, you can implement a model-driven application which doesn't care about you, your view. And it could be more efficient in this case if you have that, that big model, that, co that complex one. Thank you. So your question is, why do I need a C++ view model? Is that right? No, it's more. Why do? You no, it's more. Why do you need to care about view that much in order to implement model view view model? Because if you have that big model and important one, then you usually can uh, create not view driven application, but more uh, model driven application, which is based only on your business logic. For example, you, you probably heard about uh, RIB architecture, which you, Uber uses in their, their application, so it's kind of similar pattern. OK, no, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with that. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so give a hand for uh, David. Thanks a lot. Thanks.